Welcome. Welcome to OLC Term 1B. This is Class 3. We're working through Unit 1, and we are on Assignment Number 2. It is November 16th. We are going to start, as always, with a little bit of grammar and just kind of get our, our sentence brains warmed up here. This is a review uh, slide from a previous day. This is talking about verbs in predicates. And there are three main types of verbs, which sometimes comes as a surprise to people because a lot of times in school, they mostly talk about the action verbs, right? Action verbs are the type that describe what somebody's doing. Run, dream, oh, why is it doing it this to me? I'm so sorry, I keep thinking I've gotten this straightened out and then it somehow happens again. My apologies. If you're out there in Radio Land, I'm still here. Just the computer for some reason decided to sign me out and I'm having to go back in. Okay, I'm back in now. Um, the first type of verb describes what someone is doing. Uh, sleeping, washing, hugging, swimming, fish, draw, write. The next part is what they call state of being verbs. And the reason is because it's all about the verb to be generally. Um, that which would be like be, am, is, are, was, were, will be, and have been. And a lot of times those end up describing ha um, uh either um, an adjective describing the person or kind of renames them like John is the principal. So John is the person, but they're telling you about the job that he's doing. And then the third type of verb helps another verb and works together as a verb phrase. And that can be these, um, these state of being verbs, but there's a whole bunch of other ones that also do that job. So just being mindful of that because sometimes when it's the verb like is, for example, and people go to look at their sentences to edit and they're like, I don't know if there's a verb in there, but these all count as verbs, okay? Even if they don't, even if you can't picture an action, they still count as a verb. <clears throat> so just for practice, we're gonna look at the verbs in a sentence and then decide what type of verb it is. So he chopped the wood. Is that an action, a state of being, or is it helping? Well, I can picture chopping, so it's chopping. <laughs> All right, my new boyfriend bought me a present. Is that an action, a state of being, or is it helping? Well, I can picture somebody buying, right? They're standing at the till, they've got their money out, and they are doing an action. We're good. <laughs> the cat is black. Okay, is is our verb. Is that an action, a state of being, or helping? That's that tricky one called a state of being, okay? Right? It's just telling you what the cat looks like. The old tree is falling down quickly. Now, I've high, I've um underlined the, the verb phrase is falling, but we're just looking at the word is. Now, in this case, it's no longer functioning as a state of being. It's functioning as helping. <laughs> the next door neighbors might come over for coffee. Might come is the um, <coughs> is the verb phrase. And um, might is a helping verb. I'm hoping everything's okay out there. A lot of people kind of looking in here. The toy could arrive in the mail today. Could arrive is the whole phrase. Could is a helping verb. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's up? Sorry, something's going on, but I'm not sure what's going on. Oh. I don't know how to check that. 
This one? That's a speaker though, isn't it? Bertha, can you hear me? Can she hear me in there? Yeah? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, if anyone out there is listening, let me know if you can hear me because apparently there's a problem with the sound. All right. So that being the case, I'm going to kind of move on. Okay, so these are all the state of being verbs. <clears throat> the most common is simply the verb to be. And it can show up as the present, the past, or the future. It can also show up as singular or as plural. <clears throat> you can see all the different verb types there. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, state of being verbs describe the subject of their state or rename the subject. So things like I am hungry or she was beautiful <clears throat> or it is windy today. We were lost. They are eager to learn and he was confused. I'm going to go through and just highlight those really quickly, okay? If you're watching, see if you can figure out before I do it. <clears throat> if anyone out there is listening and can tell, give me a phone call and let me know if you can hear this or not hear it. I'm hoping one of the DECs might be listening and know. <clears throat> Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so this is kind of describing it, but we also can use state of being verbs to rename something. When basically when the narrator is telling you about a job or a role they function in, occasionally it gets used as a poetic metaphor. Like if I say, oh, my boyfriend was a snake. I don't mean he's really a snake. I mean, he's, you know, sneaky and deceptive. Okay, so here are some examples where we're using it in that way. I am the teacher. <clears throat> she is the baby in the family. They are the new nurses. We are driftwood on the ocean. Now, obviously, in that point, we're using it kind of poetically. <clears throat> She is the auto mechanic. You are the boss. We are bricks in the wall, like that song. Just another brick in the wall. Okay, and you can see too here, just like we talked about before, the subject comes first, the verb comes after. Because as we mentioned, English is a, a word order type sentence. So the subject has to come first. There are some other verbs that can function as state of being verbs. Things like seem, become, get, appear. So you seem upset. It's talking about her state or her condition. You will become a graduate in June. It gets cold in the winter. The dog appears angry. So in that case, those ones are functioning as state of being. They're not really helping verbs and they're not really action verbs. They're kind of that in-between spot. Some verbs can act as both action verbs and SOB verbs, state of being verbs. So some examples are things like, she looks tired. It tastes rotten. He feels hot. It smells spicy. So these words are describing the condition or state, right? Which would be different if I said something like I said, um, you know, I can smell the wood 
Bernie. <clears throat> there it's not really the state of being, right? I'm actually doing an action. Or if I said, um, you know, the baby felt the warm blanket. So in that case, it's an action. So these are verbs that can go both ways. Okay, and then here are the helping or what's called the auxiliary verbs. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call, sometimes you might see them called linking verbs or other things like that. It just basically means it's gonna be working with another verb, but they don't work by themselves. So for example, I have, washed the dishes. So in that case, wash is the action, but have is your helping verb. Some of the main helping verbs that get used a lot like this are do, have, will, and be. We've looked at be previously. Do is a funny one because it um it doesn't fall. It's very irregular. So it's like do, did, doing, does, or done. Have is have, has, or had, and will is just will. Although you could have it in negative as won't, I guess. Um, some more examples are I am done cooking supper. I had finished my homework by six o'clock. I will leave in an hour. Sometimes helping verbs are used to create special verb tenses. Sometimes these are called modal verbs. Like I said, the, the name of it doesn't matter so as long as you understand what it's doing. And they can show help show whether an action is possible or probable, or a need or an obligation. So some examples of these types of verbs are can, could, may, might, <clears throat> must, shall, should, would, ought to, had better, used to, need, or dare. And some examples in a sentence were like, I did clean my room. Mom needs to take her medicine. Sorry. <clears throat> she has finished all her work. Your dad could take you to the hockey game. We should cook the hot dogs soon. They might drop by for a visit. So if you look at these, um, and again, the helping verb comes in front. Um, I don't know why particularly. I just know in English that that's true. It's one of those those funny word order things that is true about English. So it comes before the action verb and it's kind of modifying or explaining the action in a sense. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just kind of doing this so that to make sure you know which part I'm talking about here. And that way too, if you look back at it later, it's already all done. You can kind of see it. Okay. Can you find the verb phrase in the sentence? Now, why am I even bothering to do this? Well, because when you guys go to check your own work and make sure it's grammatically correct, one of the big things you need to look for is um, whether there's a verb in there or a verb phrase. Because if there isn't, then it's an incomplete sentence, right? So I want to make sure that you know how to find them. That's all we're doing this for. Uh, she is beautiful. Okay, well, she is my subject. And nine times out of 10, the verb comes right after. So that would be is. And we know that that is a state of being verb. So that works. <clears throat> the doctor is saving her life. Okay, so doctor is my subject, is saving altogether, <clears throat> is my uh, verb phrase. The nurse cleaned her wounds. Nurse is my subject. Cleaned is my verb. I had nightmares in my new house. So I is my subject. So had is right back here at the beginning. And nightmares is not an action. Nightmares are a thing. So that's not part of our verb phrase. The snow was falling all night long. So the snow is our subject and was falling is our verb phrase. That scary dog might bite me. So that scary dog is our subject and might bite is our 
verb phrase. He could have fallen on the slippery subject. So he is our subject. And right after that, you've got our verb phrase. He could have fallen. Okay. Once you know how to find the subject, finding the verb phrase is usually really easy. The only time it's really hard is sometimes your subject might be really long. Um, and sometimes then you, people get confused and think they've already got a verb in there just because of the length. Okay, so assignment number two is called Growing Up in My Community. Also, for some reason, they left a blank here. This is them trying to be humorous. Please don't fill in the blank and send it to me. I don't mark this page. This is just the assignment instructions, okay? Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to skip that because I just think it's so silly. Anyways, um, this course is for anyone who wants or needs it in order to assess your literacy goals and then achieve them. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have any literacy goals. And I'm sure that if you thought that, you are not alone. So what is a literacy goal? Clearly, if you are reading this, it means you can read. So what's the point? Well, expressing yourself through writing is also useful and important, and it is a key part of this course. This course is designed not only to meet the requirements of the Ontario cur curriculum, but also, and more importantly, to help you get the most out of everything you're interested in by improving upon your communication skills. It will help you not only with your schoolwork, but also in the real world. <clears throat> For this assignment, you are to write approximately two-thirds to one page about your family and community, where you are from, growing up, your experience in school, and any other details you'd like to share. The idea here is to get you to practice writing in sentences or paragraph format. The more writing you do, the better you'll be at expressing yourself in a variety of ways, as is required in this course, especially through journal entries, informational paragraphs, news reports, and opinion pieces. Maybe you've heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. Well, you're going to get lots of practice in this course. You will need to write and submit both a rough copy and a final copy of this assignment for full marks. Again, be careful with spelling, grammar, and punctuation in your final copy. Keep in mind that capital letters need to be used correctly. We will discuss capitalization rules um, at the end of this, okay? So if you look here, the rough copy is worth 10. The final copy is worth 10. A lot of people, like a surprising number of people, only hand me in their final copy. There's no way to pass this assignment if you only hand me in half the assignment right? You have to hand me in your rough copy and your final copy. And we're going to discuss that, right? As we'll discuss this kind of thing all along. But please, this is a really crucial point. All that happens is I ask you to resubmit it and then you have to do it later on and it's kind of a, a hassle. So better just to assign, uh, hand it in all at once, okay? So always, always, always start every writing project with a brainstorming or planning session. It doesn't have to take very long. It could be like five minutes, 15 minutes. It doesn't really matter. Depends a little bit on how long the assignment is going to be. Obviously, if you're trying to brainstorm a 10-page essay, which we don't do in this course, by the way, but if you did, then you'd want to spend longer than five minutes. But most of the time, we're writing like paragraphs, maybe sometimes a series of paragraphs, that kind of thing, okay? So for this assignment, it's called Growing Up in Your Community. That's the title. So you want to think about what major topics or areas you want to discuss, and they suggest some, and their suggestions are your community, growing up, school experiences, and any other topics. That gives you room to, to mention other things, because I know some of you out there are like long out of high school, right? I have, I have very young people. I have people who are retiring. There's a really wide range in this course. So you might want to talk about your relationships, your kids, your work, other things that you've done, right? That's totally fine. That's why it's kind of written that way. So if I was going to start doing some brainstorming, I would often set up a blank or lined page with those topics in the four corners, and then I would jot down some ideas for myself. So let me show you on the next page what I mean. <laughs> so here is my brainstorming page, and I put my big topics up top, my community, growing up school experiences, and any other topics. And then I started doing some of my brainstorming. Now I'm not finished, right? Here are some things I might want to tell people about my community. Um, Windsor is larger than T-Bay, but it's not as big as Winnipeg. It's an auto town. It's next to Detroit. It's on the Detroit River. A lot of people don't know that. 
Detroit River. There are lots of farms around, uh, woods nearby, lots of pollution, lots of trade jobs. And I did I um, did my university here too, right? Because it's a, it has a university in there. Did my university here. Um, growing up, okay, I grew up, oops, <laughs> grew up on the edge of town. Now it's since built up. In other words, now there's a lot of houses there where when I was there, it wasn't. Um, woods, creeks, fields. Now this might go to talking about my community, okay? I might want to talk about my family here. <clears throat> um, my little brother, I kind of hung out with him because he was kind of close in my age. Might want to talk about some of my friends I had growing up. Might I might talk about important events. Might be maybe somebody got born or maybe somebody passed away or maybe I was really sick at that point. Um, all those things are things I might want to talk about there, okay? School experiences. What did you think of school? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you have great teachers, horrible teachers? Did you have all sorts of friends? What language did you do school in, right? Some people did um, English. Some people did both. Some people did primarily their own language, like um, Ojibwe or Cree or OG Cree. <clears throat> did you do lots of fun stuff, science experiments, cultural events, all sorts of things that you could talk about there. And then any other topics, things like marriage, kids, other training or schooling, moving, anything else you want. Keep in mind, you're not required to tell me about anything, okay? So this is just meant to be like a little intro, and we're just trying to give you practice on something you're familiar with, which is yourself, right? It's kind of one of the easiest things to talk about in some ways because you know the material. In other ways, sometimes people find it hard to talk about themselves because they feel like they're exposing themselves a little bit, like talking about things that are too personal. <laughs> if that's how it feels to you, remember that you only have to be as personal as you want to, right? You can tell me all sorts of details about growing up if you want to, and very little about school. You can tell me all about your marriage and very little about your community. You have some options here. Do you keep in mind though that the topic is supposed to be growing up in your community. So there should be something about um, your life when you were younger there, okay? Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a cough. I'm not sure why today. So I have to keep on muting things so I don't cough in your ear. I apologize. <laughs> now, one thing to keep in mind is brainstorming is not the same thing as your rough draft. Sometimes people aren't really sure what the rough draft is, and they just try to hand me down their brainstorming like this. I have absolutely had people hand me in this. I can't really mark this. This is just for yourself, okay? This isn't your rough draft. Your rough draft has to be in sentences. So here's kind of a little uh, comparison, right? Brainstorming could be a word or a phrase. It might be doodle. I don't care. It's for yourself, right? Any length that is helpful does not need to be complete sentences. You've got no concerns for spelling, grammar, or punctuation. It is not handed in. And even if you do hand it in, I don't really mark it, okay? Rough draft. It must be in full sentences. It must be in paragraph format. It must be a certain length. So for here, the assignment is two-thirds to a full page. It will get handed in, and I will mark it. <clears throat> so those are some of the major differences, all right? Now, let me show you how the differences look. Just looking at that, like here is my brainstorming from yesterday. You can see this isn't something you would hand in, right? There's no real way for somebody to mark this. It's just me making up little notes for how I'm going to write. The rough draft has to look like this. It's got to have sentences. It's in a paragraph, right? It's, it's like what you would read um, in a book almost, right? Very short, but it's still. So... <clears throat> I think this is um, an example from yesterday. I feel like the grandfather teachings are important to live life. Yeah, bravery has been the most important one for me. I am not naturally very brave. I always want to hide away from hard things, but many of the best events in my life have happened because I was brave and I did things even when it was really hard for me, like moving away from home. Now, as you can see, I have deliberately left spelling errors, punctuation errors, capitalization errors, you don't need to worry too much about those in the rough draft, okay? 
you do need to worry about them when you get to your good copy. Okay. Your rough draft is why you're beginning to think about your, your arguments, your opinions, your summaries, how to put everything into sentences. It's kind of your starting point. I think sometimes people are, they're handing me in beautiful rough drafts that I think probably means they did a, a little rough draft of their own and then handed me in the nice version, but then they're not sure what to hand in for the good copy. Okay. So um, it's really important. Uh, you do want to have a rough draft that you can then make better and make as good as you can to hand in as a good copy. <clears throat> so we talk about paragraph format. Well, what exactly is a paragraph? A paragraph is just a group of sentences that have a common theme or topic. They can often range from four to eight sentences in length. Um, oh, in school format means, you know, uh, a writer who is writing in a newspaper might have a different uh, range. A novelist might stick 10 sentences together. Um, <clears throat> when we're working for school, four to eight is pretty typical. Um, writers can show a new paragraph has started in two possible ways. One, by leaving a space between one paragraph and the next one or two, by putting an indent at the beginning of each paragraph. The first one where you leave a space, that's way more common these days, especially if you're writing on computers. The second one where you put an indent is more common in handwriting. Either way is totally acceptable to me, unless an assignment specifically asks you to do it one way or the other. But you do wanna make sure when you're writing an entire page that there are paragraphs. It would be really rare for the entire page to be all on one topic, okay? <clears throat> so this, this isn't anything you can read, by the way. This is just um, placeholder text. Here, they've done the indents. You can see there's a little indent, and then you have the paragraph, indent, paragraph. Over here, there's no indent, but they've left a space. <clears throat> because of computers and because how much people use their phones, this often holds up a little bit better. Um, and if you wanted to count the paragraphs, we've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. Same thing over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, because this one has a little bit more on it. I'm not sure. Oh, because this one has more spaces. So there's not room. This one has a seven. Sorry, I apologize. It's completely wrong. Um, so either way is fine. Basic upshot. This is the typical paragraph format. You might have heard it called in school a hamburger format. Um, and the idea is just kind of, it's a kind of a visual just to help you picture it, which is the, the bun is like the topic sentence and the closing sentence. And often they kind of restate the same information. And then all the interesting details are the middle, they're all the juicy bits here. So the parts of a paragraph, the topic sentence tells the reader the main idea or what the paragraph will be about. So if it's an opinion, that's where you would tell me your opinion. And then you would have three or more sentences where it gives you details that support the main idea or expand on the main idea or tell me a little bit more, basically all those kind of things. And then when we get to the last sentence, we kind of sum up the topic or summarize what we said. The way I had always heard it explained when I was in school was tell them what you're going to talk about in your topic sentence, then talk about it, all your little details, and then summarize what you talked about or tell them what you told them. It sounds, um, it sounds like too much repetition, right? And you have to do it carefully so it doesn't just sound repetitive. But it often takes a fair bit of repetition for us to understand or fully comprehend something. So this paragraph kind of is aware of that and makes use of it. <clears throat> the very best way to make sure your assignment is in paragraph format is simply plan it that way right from the beginning. The topics you used for brainstorming can be a good start. So maybe your first topic, first paragraph is my community. Second paragraph is growing up. Third paragraph is school experiences. And then maybe the fourth paragraph, if you have one, is what's happening right now. And again, 
if you are uncomfortable with sharing what's happening right now, you don't have to. You're totally fine to stop at school experiences, okay, guys? Let's say you've worked ahead, you've already done your writing, and you weren't thinking about paragraphs at all. Ah, how do you go back and fix it? So first of all, I would take a pencil. That way I can fix things if I change my mind about where the paragraph starts and ends. And then I would go through and I start to see where do my topics seem to change? Because the end of a paragraph would usually start with the last sentence of my first topic. And then the new paragraph would start with the first sentence of the new paragraph, which would be a new topic. And usually in editing, you have kind of like a little L shape that shows where the new paragraph would start, okay? So in the yellow, we've got like a little uh, run on writing and we're gonna think about how to put it in paragraphs. Where should I start the paragraph? Well, we gotta think about where does the topic change? So let's read this. I had lots of great experiences growing up. We did a lot of hunting and camping. In the summer, my friends and I swam a lot. School was never my favorite thing. I would rather be outside than sitting down. I did enjoy math. Okay, so the first part of this paragraph is talking about growing up, but the second part is talking about school. So here is the beginning of my first paragraph, okay? That's where I've started. And over here, after I talked about swimming, is where I've ended. Here is a new paragraph. I could put another one of these if I wanted to. I could copy, paste, and put it over here if I have wanted to, okay? I know I'm kind of covering things up at the moment, but that's kind of giving you an idea basically of how it might look, okay? So if you didn't remember to write in paragraphs, go back and find where the paragraphs are, okay? <clears throat> so here's an example of a paragraph. I'm doing it on a slightly different topic so that I don't, you know, use up all sorts of ideas. Um, and again, I've used the format of here's my topic, here's my closing, and here's my details in the middle. I did them all slightly different colors just so you'd kind of see the, the, the correlation. So here's my topic sentence. My favorite part of school, high school, was always art class. And then my closing sentence kind of echoes that. Art class seemed more like a place for fun than work, which is why I loved it so much. And then in the middle, I have all my different details. It was such a nice change to be working with images rather than words. There's my first sentence on this. My favorite classroom, my favorite teacher's classroom was like an explosion of color and crazy objects for us to draw. It was like walking into an antique store. Now I'm gonna point something out. This is actually two sentences, but they're talking about the same detail or concept. So that's totally fine. It's just, uh, just trying to show you that it doesn't have to be one detail, one sentence necessarily. Uh, detail three, we got to work with so many different mediums, oil pastels, chalk, charcoal, watercolors, and acrylics, period. It was so fun to explore them all. Here's another one where I have two sentences explaining this one detail or this one idea, okay? Now, obviously, I would never hand it in this way because this is a list format. This isn't a paragraph format. In paragraph format, the sentences would just follow one right after another. There wouldn't be any color coding or any of that. So I'm gonna show you that on the next page. My favorite part of high school was always art class. It was such a nice change to be working with images rather than words. My favorite teacher's classroom was like an explosion of color and crazy objects for us to draw. It was like walking into an antique store. We got to work with so many different mediums, oil pastels, chalk, charcoal, watercolors, and acrylics. It was so fun to explore them all. Art class seemed more like a place for fun than work, which is why I loved it so much. Now, again, this is my rough copy, so there are all sorts of mistakes in there. Some of you are probably seeing them right now and going, oh, why hasn't she changed that? Because I'm trying to make a point. And the point is that in the rough copy, the whole thing is getting your ideas down in, an, in a paragraph and sentence format. You can always clean it up later. Now, some people automatically remember all the capitalization rules and the punctuation rules. And if you are one of those lucky people, that is awesome. Use them as you write. But for some people, you have to really think about them. 
And it can be hard to think about them and still think about your ideas it becomes kind of too much. So what we're doing is trying to split it up. So rough copy is where you think about your ideas and the revision and editing stage is when you begin to clean it up and start to make sure everything follows all the rules. Okay. After I did all my brainstorming, I would write a rough draft for each paragraph, and I would leave a bit of a space between the paragraphs in case I had some extra sentences or details I wanted to add later. After I had all my rough paragraphs written, I would check to be sure that I have the length somewhere between at least two thirds to a full page. Then I would take a picture of it or I would photocopy it before I look at it to make any changes. And I can hand this copy in when I hand the assignment in. Or if I don't like some of the changes I make, because that happens sometimes, I can always go back to my original, right? Sometimes you change something and you think you're kind of going somewhere and you're like, oh, you know what? I think I actually said it better the first time. And that's fine. Go ahead and use back to it. However, remember, you must hand in a rough copy or you lose half your marks. <clears throat> so. Once you're revising your rough draft, here is the basic version. We're going to talk about things more in depth as we go along, but this is only our second assignment. So we're not going to get too in depth here. Okay. Hopefully. Um, the first thing to do when you're revising any type of writing is always to check. Does it make sense? That is the most important thing. It is what I am looking at. And that is where you're going to get the most of your marks. Is it clear what you're trying to say or do you need to add some details or reword it a little bit? Sometimes when we're writing quickly, we might skip some of the little words. Or we might write a really long sentence that seemed fine at the time, but then when you're reading back, it's a little confusing. I do that all the time. Second, we need to check our sentence structure. These are the most common grammatical errors in any writing. Okay? Third, then we can check for punctuation, capitalization, and spelling errors. checking for sense. So here's an example. What's wrong and how can I fix it? You can look for missing words, words that are used twice, or places where the meaning is confusing. My favorite spot was down by the beach where the rocks can sit on to watch the sunset. Okay, I'm sort of confused by that. The first part I think is pretty clear. My favorite oops, spot was down by the beach near the rocks um near the rocks i think she's using rocks at the end of the sentence and then using rocks again at the beginning but she or he's forgetting that they have to do it twice right near the rocks. The rocks are, the rocks are where I can sit to watch the sunset. So that's the kind of thing that can happen if you're writing fast or it's late, or sometimes, you know, somebody was talking to you in the middle of your writing and you got kind of confused as to what you were writing. So I've gone back and I've made sure the meaning is, is more clear. Art, was never good at it, never like it, never care about it. Okay, so this is one where somebody's kind of written sort of the way they talk. And I know what they're getting at, but it's not super clear in the, the meaning, okay? I would change it around because I know they're talking about art, but it says art was never not good at it. It's not that the art wasn't good, it's that that person feels like they weren't good at it. So I was never good at art, but I never liked it or cared about it. So I think that captures the meaning of what this was trying to get across, but I've captured it in a, in a way that makes more sense, hopefully. We went biking the pit. They said it was okay. All right. So it's not really clear who the, who the they is. Um, we went 
biking to the pit, right? Um, they said it was okay. I'm going to say maybe our parents. Our parents said it was okay. So in this case, um, it didn't make sense because they were using a pronoun, they, but we didn't know who the they was because it wasn't stated in the first part of the sentence. So I had to go back and make it clearer. Okay. Sentence structure. Okay. So understanding sentence structure is a really, it's a major theme of this course. A lot of us were just taught a sentence expresses a complete thought. But sometimes that isn't really all that helpful. It is one part of the definition of a sentence, but there is a lot more to sentence structure than just that. So a working definition of a basic or a simple sentence is that it has to have three things, a subject, a predicate, and it expresses a complete thought, okay? Remember that a predicate is the verb plus any connected words that um, relate to the verb. <clears throat> so, Again, just kind of practicing. Do these sentences have all these three things? Do they have the subject, the predicate, and the complete thought? If not, what is it missing? This is intended as an interactive exercise. So if I had people online, I'd be able to do it with them. I don't, so we will just practice here. And if you are at home watching this on YouTube later, you can try and kind of get the answers before I get them. Hated school growing up. Okay. Does it have a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought? There is no subject there. That is what it is missing. Okay. So, does have a predicate. There is a verb. It does connect to things. It isn't quite a complete thought because it doesn't have the subject. My favorite part of Windsor. Is there a subject? Yeah, that's my subject, but there's no predicate. It doesn't tell me what about my favorite part of Windsor. Maybe I was going to say what I did at the favorite part or who knows. So again, because it's missing that, it isn't really got a complete thought. Okay. Was wishing for a long time that things would be different. Does this have a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought? This is a tricky one, but if I look at the first words, was wishing... Those are verbs. So there's no subject that I can see, right? So I'm missing that. Because of that, it also does not have a complete thought, okay? After all that happened, huh? Now, it's not really telling me, I don't think there's a subject there. After all, what happened? After all that happened. This is a funny one. Predicate. There's not even really a predicate here. And it's certainly not a complete thought. <laughs> right? It's really more of an adverb phrase. It's just kind of, um, it would modify a predicate, but it's not really a predicate by itself. The most beautiful place with a river, rocks, and a lovely beach. Huh. Well, here's the beginning of my subject, but there's no verb there with the river, rocks, and a lovely beach. It's kind of more like a really, really, really long subject. <clears throat> so it's got a subject, but there's no predicate because there's no verb. And it also really isn't a complete thought. Now, a lot of these could be easily changed to create, oops, sorry to create a complete thought, but at the moment it doesn't have one. Sorry, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna leave that for right now. Okay, we've got about six minutes. Okay, that only covers simple sentences. I don't wanna overwhelm you guys by giving too much information at once. So we're gonna cover the other kinds of sentences on a different day. And I know this really all depends, right? Some people were taught a lot of grammar in school some people weren't. I felt like I had a teacher in grade five who was really keen on grammar and taught us so much, but I honestly don't remember other teachers talking a whole lot about it. So everybody's experience with this might vary. So for some of you, this might seem really too easy. And why are you talking about this? 
and other people might not have ever really heard any of this kind of stuff and I don't really know so I apologize if you're bored and feel like this is kind of too easy um, I also apologize if you feel like it's a little bit too hard because it's more than you've ever heard again because I've got such a wide range of students I have to just kind of aim for the middle and hope that I'm uh, helping the most students that way uh, the major issue I see when I'm reading people's writing is students are writing a paragraph as one long sentence. Um, if you start a new topic or a new subject or a new activity or a new action, it's a really strong possibility that you started a new sentence without realizing it. And I think this is partly due to us messaging so much with Facebook and stuff like that. It seems like we don't really use uh, periods much. And I don't know if it's because it's on another screen on our phones or what, but we don't use them as often. I think a lot of times we've gotten out of habit, out of the habit of using a period. So since we're writing these paragraphs on ourselves or sometimes like our family, a good hint is to check on the word I or we. It's really common for that to be the subject of a sentence in this particular essay, not in, not in every sentence I'd ever wear. So if you're using those kind of phrases again, it's a really good hint that you might have started a new sentence. <clears throat> oh, I can see I'm going to run out of time here. But I really want to do this. Okay. So help me turn this run-on sentence into several simple sentences. I'm not going to get complex. We're going to go simple here, okay? I got to go to California. My trip to California was so much fun, okay? I got to go to California, period. My trip. Now, it's the beginning, so i got to put a capital there. My trip to California was so much fun. All right. There's a sentence, period. I went with my cousin, period. I couldn't believe my parents let us go on the planes when we were only 12 years old. Oh, uh, I think that's probably enough because then I start to talk about a whole lot of other stuff at once. Um, it was my favorite aunt. It was my favorite aunt. So maybe that was why they let us go, period. California was beautiful, but it was also really hot, period. There were orange trees in her backyard, <clears throat> period. We went to the beach. Okay. So I haven't found all the sentence errors, but you see what I'm saying where it's not just one big long sentence. Every time a new subject starts, I have to start a new sentence. So, <clears throat> punctuation review. For the moment, avoid semicolons and colons until we have a chance to talk about them more. I should get to them next week sometime, okay? But just for right now, they are tricky, so just kind of leave them for the moment. Interrogative or question sentences end with a question mark. Imperative and exclamatory sentences and with an exclamation point. They're not commonly used in academic writing, although it might get used in your um, essay. Declarative are telling sentences and imperative or commanding sentences can both end with periods. For the most part, your sentences are going to end with a period. That's just the most common type of punctuation in any type of writing, really. Hang on a sec. <coughs> We're just going to end here with the capitalization rules. And I don't think I talked about this that much last term, but again, a lot of this you probably already know, but I'm spelling it out in case, in case you're not familiar or if you've forgotten some bits. So we always use capital letters at the beginning of a name, right? Or at the beginning of a sentence to write the word I. You can't send me in the little I like that. It doesn't work. It has to be the capital I. I know it looks a little bit like an L. I can't help that. If you want to, you can put the capital I that has the little header and uh, footer on it. For the names of months and dates, like January, February, or Monday, Tuesday, for titles, Mr., Mrs., Ms., Doctor, they all have capitals at the beginning. For the name of a street, Front Street, or um, Wellington, they have to have a capital. The name of a business, Amazon, 
um, Twitter, uh, Red Apple. For the names of books or movies or games, Fortnite would have a capital F, for example. For the names of places like towns, cities, reservations, provinces, states, countries, continents. So Sioux Lookout would have capital. Uh, Winnipeg would have a capital. All these different things I'm going to keep on going. The name of a body of water like Atlantic Ocean, monuments or buildings that have a specific name like the CN Tower or Massey Hall, the name of an airport, a train station or a bus station, the names of parks or the names of natural landmarks. So this the um, the assignment specifically mentions capital capitalization as being something they're going to look at. So please be aware of using the capitalization rules. Okay, we will have to look at the rules tomorrow for practicing. I am just going to quickly put a little star here so that I remember, maybe I'll put a heart, so that I remember that I need to start here, okay? I will talk to you guys, actually, oh, not tomorrow, it will be Monday. Monday, we will get back together and look at the next assignment, okay? Thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope you found this helpful. Mm-hmm.